Hi, I'm Kristen Grauman, and this talk is about how we are linking audio and visual signals in order to have greater spatial understanding. To set the stage in the context of this workshop, which is on omnidirectional vision, uh, let's look at what audio provides us. So even if we have a narrower field of view camera, the audio signals we receive are from all sides, right? So we can see in front of us, but we can hear all around us. And the work I'm going to show you today looks at ways to leverage this link and, in fact, to get greater spatial description of audio and visual data by looking at them together. So this is about learning the link between sight, sound, and space. And there's two main things I'll share. And these are new results from the group about first spatializing audio from video, where we'll look at results both with narrow field of view video and 360 inputs. And then the second part will be about spatializing visual features where we learn from echoes. So let's look at that first part. Now to set the stage here, watch this video and imagine yourself in the scene. Okay, you can see in this sample how important the directionality of the audio was for this videographer. And indeed, when we're in environments like this, we're looking, but we're also listening, and the sounds that we receive have a strong spatial component. And in this case, even told the person where to look. So why do we have spatial effects in audio? We have two ears, and we receive what's called binaural sound, and so that means we can localize sounds in the world, like this red sound source here, by differences in the timing of when the sound signals reach either ear, as well as differences in their intensity or level, because one sound will be dampened a bit by the head being in front of it. And so there, we know that this is true, that we can get this kind of spatial richness from our two ears with binaural sound, but at the same time, algorithms today are generally processing single channel audio or monaural audio in which the spatial effects have been collapsed and it's just a flat audio sound. So the idea we had was to introduce two and a half D visual sound. The goal is to be able to take monaural audio as input and generate its binaural counterpart. Or in other words, to lift the mono sound into binaural sound such that it would sound spatially rich, as if the observer at the camera was hearing the sounds with two ears. Now, how will we do this lifting? The key ingredient is the visual input. So because we can learn from video in which there is mono sound, but also the spatial information within the scene of the visual frame, then we can have a signal from which to learn this lifting. So why do we want to infer binaural sound? There's two ideas and motivations here. One is simply to upgrade the audio experience. So think of a listener of some video who now, with the proper predicted binaural audio, can feel as if they're immersed in that scene, hearing things come from the directions which they would come. But also, we're interested in this process of 2.5D visual sound in order to improve our representations, and in particular to improve audio source separation, because these um, embeddings that we learn doing this task will be forced to zoom in on the link between where the sounds are coming from and which objects are sounding. So back to this idea then, let me sketch out a bit about the approach for 2.5D visual sound. So during training we have binaural sound that was captured with a rig and we can artificially collapse that to mono audio and extract a spectrogram capturing the frequencies of the sound over time. Meanwhile, in the visual stream, we have the visual frames in which um, we can see the different sound makers that are there. And so the heart of this approach will be to have a network that can convert from mono to binaural sound. So we're going to train it to take these two streams, mono audio and visual, and predict the proper binaural sound, such that at test time, when we no longer see the binaural sound as input, we can still do this lifting to the multi-channel audio. So a little bit more detail about how this approach works, the mono to binaural network. So again, we're having the visual stream from that, we'll do some standard encoding um, to start with the ResNet. And then on the 
This uh, audio stream will have the binaural audio mixed into mono for training data, and from there extract the spectrogram, and now we'll have a UNET encoder to extract and learn the audio features, and now we'll bring those visual and audio features together, tiled and concatenated such that after some up convolutions at the right side of that UNET, we are going to be targeting the reconstruction of the mask on the spectrogram that would produce the output. And in fact, the output we want here is binaural sound, but we encode that in terms of the difference between the proper right and left channels. Okay, so we're trying to go from audio and visual, learn the mask that will produce um, the binaural sound, encode it as the difference. So taking back that mask, then now on the left-hand side, this is our target. And once we've, you know, to the extent we do this estimate correctly, it will be applied to mask the input audio spectrogram, and then use that to add back to the mono input in order to reconstruct the left and right channel for the binaural sound. Okay. So think of it as learning a filter to apply to the original input of the spectrogram and to create the, the difference in the left and right ears so that you can reconstruct them based on just the mono non-spatial sound. Now, to do this work, we also started by creating a data set that's publicly available. It's called Fair Play, and it was captured with a rig that you see here with some off-the-shelf components. So there's GoPro camera for the eyes, there are 3D IO binaural microphones for the ears, which are um, separated at an average head width in order to capture those time delays and effects, as well as having that outer ear shape to mimic that, a typical human head or outer ear shape for a person. So we have the eyes and the ears in this rig, so we'll receive binaural sound to capture this training data. And then we took this rig into a large music room that has a variety of different instruments, and we had a number of different volunteers come in and play in different combinations. Now the camera can move, people can move, we're just getting video in this room captured with binaural sound. And in total, this yielded about five hours of total video. Okay, so in addition to this fair play data set I just described, we've also been training and testing this approach with some YouTube video data that was um, collected from uh, this work by Morgado and colleagues. These are videos that are outside of music, including music, tourism, street scenes, sports, things like you see at the bottom left. And there is about a thousand of these clips and the input clips are 360 videos. Okay, so these are the two domains in which we're going to test. And before I show you numbers and you know how well can we do this reconstruction, let's look at a, a couple examples. Now we want to look and listen. Now the key is to listen to these properly and hear the spatial sound. You'll need to listen with headphones from the samples on our web page below, so that you're assured that the left and right audio waveforms that the algorithm is producing meet your left and right ear appropriately. So with that said, listen to these from the link, but here in the talk, I'll just show them and play the sound, but I don't believe through this video recording you'll, you'll hear the left and right um, because of the way the video is stored. Here we go. Here's an input video on the top. Also input to the algorithm is the black monaural audio waveform. And as output, we're trying to produce those left and right audio waveforms, the blue and the red. And so I'm gonna show those. I'm also gonna show below them what is the ground truth for this particular video in terms of its binaural sound. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so you could get a glimpse of how we could go from what the system sees and hears in a flat, non-spatial way to extrapolate beyond to the spatial sound. And again, listen to it on, from our webpage with earphones to really hear the spatialization. Now, to try and better convey right now to you what this, how good is the quality of the spatialization, I'll describe an experiment we did with human subjects. The idea was to allow them to first just listen to the sound that our method produced. So they do not see the video, but they can hear the sound that our system produced. And then after doing that, we would ask them questions like, where is the drum? Where is the piano? And to the extent that they can point on, you know, in, in the frame without seeing that visual frame, 
then we know that there's realism in the audio that was created. So we did this across the test data, and if a user was given the true binaural sound, they could make these spatializations with about 80% correctness. If instead they were given our algorithm's output, they could do it with about 68% correctness. If instead they had the best baseline's output, it would be um, about 38%. So that gives you a sense that even with correct sound, humans are about 80% to localize, and in the mid-60s, um, using the created sound from this approach. Now here's another sample. This one is um, not from music, but instead from the 360 video inputs. And I'll do this, play this in the very same way that we just saw the last one. Well, thanks again for watching this video. Hope you enjoy more recipes on. Well, thank well, thanks again for watching this video. Hope you enjoy more recipes on JeffMobile.com. Have a great day and uh, bye bye for now. Okay, so here's a 360 instance where we see everything around and then we spatialize the audio. And again, listen to this with headphones from the website to hear the spatial richness. Now, of course, this, this approach does not always work. And to give you one example of a failure case I'll play in just a moment, this one is quite difficult because of the number of sound sources and their variety, um, not to mention the diversity of these YouTube videos uh, in the 360 collection uh, for the types of sounds and objects that are present. So here's one where we are just not able to spatialize well. Too much love, put his in a stance With some real problems, with the cinnamons And the borders and the bombs and the babies The king shot down in the world for the place to shine in So overall, looking at the data sets I described, Fair Play on the left and then the three YouTube videos just to the right, here we're looking at absolute accuracy, in fact error, in terms of how different is the true binaural waveform for left and right ears to the ones that we're creating. And now we're comparing to a series of baselines including ambisonics, which is the work from Margato and colleagues, a baseline that uses only audio and can't see the pixels, one that flips the pixels such that the spatial relationships should be destroyed, and one that just copies the monaural audio twice, which is not crazy because the mono to binaural differences are going to be slight and subtle. And we see that you know across these baselines and across these data sets, the approach we proposed is giving um, strong results. So this is quite encouraging for um, pushing towards more and more connection between spatial understanding in the audio stream and spatial understanding in the visual stream. The other thing we wanted to know is what is responsible for creating these correct binaural sound outputs. And here's just a glimpse of that on the top from the music scene, on the bottom from one of the 360 clips, where on the right hand side we're showing those patches which when ablated from the input would most increase the loss for that example. So in other words, these are the parts of the scene that were most responsible on the visual side for the algorithm knowing how to create that spatial sound. And you can see it does indeed correspond to things we might expect as important, like the people, the instruments they're playing, and in the bottom, the road with the cars in it. And finally, um, just a hint of a result here, because we've been looking at how this representation we're learning, which is uh, really learn in a self-supervised way, right? Because we just have unlabeled video combined with this um, audio. The encodings we learn from those networks actually uh, embeds within it this uh, explicit spatial understanding. And we found that that does help us to do tasks like audio source separation, where we want to see the video, hear the sounds, and then come back with soundtracks for each of the sounding objects one at a time. Okay, you can look to our papers for, for some of these results in that. Now in the remainder, um, the last part of this talk, I'm gonna cover this uh, new work on spatializing visual features from echoes. Okay, and we're still in this space of being able to see the sounds in space and be able to learn this link between what we're seeing and hearing and where it is. And we're looking to do this now in a slightly different way. 
And the key uh, emphasis here is on echolocation and the use of echolocation as an omnidirectional spatial sensor. So in this case, I'm talking no longer about human captured video, but we're going to be thinking about agents in the 3D world. So here I have an agent in this apartment and it could be anywhere kind of looking and listening to its environment. And if it emits a sound actively, then it will hear some echoes. And as we know from animal species and um, that, that, that use sound as a way to perceive their environment, there will be signals about both the, um, the geometry of the room as well as materials in the space. So what does this echolocation mean for us here in computer vision? Um, what the idea is going to be to learn a visual representation that exploits what's available at training in the audio side to do new, to do better at some spatial tasks. So first, how do we get the data to create these echoes? So in some other work in the group, we've developed a simulation platform for these 3D environments. And so we started by looking at the replica scenes from the public Facebook data set. These are real world 3D scans of the environment. And we get a state of the art audio simulation for it. And in fact, we pre-computed at all the yellow locations you see here, such that with the room impulse response at every source and receiver pairing, you can render the sound of interest for some new waveform by convolving it with that room impulse response at the appropriate position. And what that means is you can place an agent anywhere in the scene and a sound source somewhere else and hear that properly. And including in our case for echolocation, this means placing the agent and the sound at the same position. So the agent emits uh, a sweep signal and it, uh, here called a chirp, and then it will receive the echoes that, um, that are heard and we can receive them, importantly, as we place the agent at any number of origins. So here in this view then, now we're looking top down, suppose the agent is there at that cross arrow, then we can look forward or to any side from that agent's view within the scene, sense the egocentric RGB in depth, and also sense the egocentric echoes, here shown on the top right as the spectrograms for the left and right ears. So those are the echo responses, and now imagine getting that, not just when the agent faces left, but also when the agent rotates at some number of, of directions. Okay, so the agent will see something different for each time. It'll also receive slightly different echoes. And remember, this is because of the shape of the scene it affects the echoes it receives. So we did a, a case study to first see how much spatial information can we pull from the echoes themselves. And so to do this, we first looked at, well, can we predict a depth map entirely from the echoes? And so think of this as echo to depth. And then we thought about, well, how would that compare to monocular RGB to depth um, pipelines? And finally, do things get better when we put together both RGB and echoes in order to predict depth? And the short answer here is that there are spatial cues within the audio. Um, and in fact, if you just produce depth maps for these two examples here on the left from echoes, you'll get reasonable depth maps from the echo only, from the RGB only, and in fact, they do measurably get better when we incorporate both of these cues together. Now, the real idea then is to build a visual representation that exploits um, the echo sensing during training only. And the idea to get there is to learn a visual representation based on the congruence between an echo and the visual view. Okay, so it looks like this. The agent sees something where it's currently um, looking and we'll have a visual echo net there. And then the agent hears something from that pose as well. But in this case, during training, we're gonna couple that visual input with one of the orientations at which the ears could be pointed. So the echo will receive from one of either the same orientation that the agent is looking or an orientation to the right or behind or to the left. Okay, so it's pairing like this. And now the visual and audio streams come through. We have layers in here to learn representations from them. And the task for this self-supervised agent is to predict the orientation of the sound. Okay, so it knows what it's seeing and it hears these echoes, it needs to decide, are they congruent? Are the echoes what I would hear if I, as I face this way? Or if not, which of the other directions should, should this, um, would this sound have been coming from? 
Okay, so this is a neat way, we think, to try and link these two, kind of the omnidirectional sound, the sound as I receive it, as I face different ways in the world, with the agent's understanding of what it would see. And now, keep in mind, this is all learned um, such that at uh, test time, we have only the visual stream, right? So what have we done? We've got now this visual echo net that has embedded within it this link between the space, the 3D space of the environment and what was heard, but now at test time, we can have RGB images only and get this better encoding the input. And in fact, we showed that we can use this to tackle monocular depth prediction. So if you pre-train with the Visual Echoes features, this is going to give results like you see here in the bottom row on the um, well-known benchmark NYU. And keep in mind doing this with no audio input. And furthermore, for three different downstream tasks, uh, not just depth prediction, as I was just mentioning, but also surface normal estimation and visual navigation. These are all tasks that demand a strong spatial encoding from the RGB. And this is what we're improving by doing this self-supervised learning of visual echoes. Okay, and in fact, with the tables on the right are all showing you is that it's not just better than learning from scratch, but it's also competitive with, if not sometimes outperforming, learning with a heavily supervised pre-trained network. Okay, so I'll stop here. This is our work on um, trying to learn this connection between what we see, what we hear, and what the space of the environment is. And I showed you two, two key ideas, one to an AFD visual sound, and the other, this work on visual echoes. And the work I presented today is done in collaboration with all the people you see here, Rohan, Chanan, Carl, Dad, and myself. Thank you.